uh, Blackbeard the terrorist, uh, where Bin Laden, whose beard has been getting grayer and grayer and grayer, suddenly has a purely black uh, beard. <laughs> These guys are not geniuses. If if the if the if our news organizations or our Congress were doing one tenth of their job, this would have been exposed long, long, long ago. In fact, I have one of my books, I think it's actually my favorite uh, book, <laughs> it's called 9-11 Contradictions, an open letter to Congress and the press, and I lay out 25 internal contradictions within the official story. There's no theory in this book, you can't dismiss it as conspiracy theory, it's just fact that this person who supports the official theory contradicts this person who supports the official theory on some very crucial thing, like uh, what time did Dick Cheney go down to the underground bunker where he became in charge that morning? Did he go down at about 9.10 or 9.15? as almost everybody reports, or did he go down at almost 10 o'clock, 45 minutes later, after the Pentagon attack, as the 9-11 Commission uh, report says. And uh, that's just one of 25. And uh, if the press had been doing its job, just revealing those contradictions, you wouldn't have to talk about contradictions of laws and physics in the Pentagon and the World Trade Center, just internal contradictions. But they won't report them an open letter to Congress and the press, and not one mainstream newspaper, magazine, TV station, radio station has even mentioned the existence of a book that is reporting these contradictions in the official story. And they show you just how incompetent these guys were. It is, you know, people say, it couldn't have been an inside job. These guys were too incompetent. Exactly. They were horribly incompetent. It's it's just the press has covered up their in incompetence. But I digress. My next book after this little book um, is about World Trade Center 7, the NIST report about it. It'll be called The Mysterious Collapse of Building 7, um, why the final official 9-11 report is unscientific and false. Um, and I show in the book that uh, uh, the NIST report about Building 7 confirms what the 9-11 movement has already said, always said about Building 7. It's the Achilles heel. Because their report makes clear that a defense of the official theory, a coherent, <laughs> rational defense, is simply impossible. Um, First of all, they had to commit various kinds of scientific fraud in order even to get their theory, uh, get what looked like a plausible theory. Uh, scientific fraud mainly has uh, three major categories. There's fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. Now, plagiarism doesn't come into play here because um, I don't want to be unkind, but I think nobody had said anything stupid enough that these guys wanted to copy. Uh, so we're only talking about the uh, fabrication and falsification, but there's one kind of falsification that is extremely important, that is ignoring relevant evidence. NIST had to ignore so much relevant evidence, such as an abundant amount of melted steel in the rubble of the World Trade Center. Now, maybe technically melted iron, which is a byproduct of thermite. But uh, the point is that an enormous amount of steel had uh, melted. Likewise, the World Trade Center dust reveals the exi uh, existence of an enormous quantity of particles that could have been formed only at extremely high temperatures. We're talking about 5,000 degrees Fahrenheit or higher. And fire, as you know, can, uh, an open diffuse fire like this, can at most get to 1,800 degrees 
Fahrenheit, and the World Trade Center fires wouldn't have even been that hot. Even Thomas Eager of MIT says they were probably only 1,300 degrees, 1,400 at the most. So how did things that took 5,000 degrees to melt them, how did they show up in the World Trade Center dust? And as Alphonse mentioned earlier, the dust even includes active thermitic material that appears to be unreacted nanothermite. Now, um, as many of you know, nanoscience, nanotechnology is the, is the rage now. If you want to get a new building, you apply for a nanoscience or nanotechnology building. There's a vast amount of money for this uh, really popular uh, development. Um, with regard to thermite, thermite is an incendiary. It starts fires. But nanothermite is a high explosive. So it is enormously more powerful than ordinary thermite. And uh, so unreacted thermite, uh, nanothermite, appears to be in the World Trade Center dust. And this is, as Alphon indicated, uh, an extremely big story that is getting enormous amount of attention already uh, in various parts of the world. Partly because the first author, the lead author, is Niels Herrick, a professor of chemistry at the University of Copenhagen, who is himself an expert in nanochemistry. When NIST was asked whether it had checked the dust for evidence of thermite, and here using thermite in the inclusive that would include nanothermite, it said no. When a reporter asked Michael Newman, a NIST spokesperson, why not, he said, because there was no evidence of that. <laughs> this circular answer asked the reporter to ask, but how can you know there's no evidence if you don't look for it first? Newman said, if you're looking for something that isn't there, you're wasting your time and the taxpayer's money. I'm not making this stuff up. <laughs> NIST also ignored and distorted testimonial evidence that explosions had gone off in Building 7. Now, many of those reports uh, came late in the day, just before the building came down. But in some respects, the most important testimony was given by Barry Jennings of the New York House City Housing Authority. As soon as the North Tower was struck that morning at 846, Jennings rushed, as he was supposed to do, to the 23rd floor of Building 7, which was where Mayor Giuliani had his Office of Emergency Management. He was accompanied by Michael Hess, who was the Corporation Counsel of the uh, City of New York, and therefore Giuliani's lead attorney. And when they got there at 9 o'clock, uh, they found everybody was gone. They skedaddled very quickly, still smoking uh, coffee cups on the desk. So they phoned up, said, what should we do? They were told, you get out of there immediately. So they tried to go down the elevator. The elevator wouldn't work. They started running down the stairs. But when they got down to the sixth floor, Jennings said there was a huge explosion that knocked the landing out from under us. We're just barely able to hold on. We pulled ourselves up. We went back up to the eighth floor. We broke the window, signaled for help. When I looked out the window, I saw the North Tower, the South Tower. Both towers still standing. However, when Giuliani wrote a book about uh, the next year and included a section about his friend Michael Hess's 9-11 experience, he said that what these men thought was an explosion was really just debris from the collapse of the North Tower. Now, that occurred at 1028. What they were talking about occurred evidently by about 9.15. So we're talking about a difference of an hour and a quarter. How could that possibly be the same event? Nevertheless, this became the official story. It was defended by NIST in its 2005 report and again in its World Trade Center 7 report. And then 
supported by uh, BBC Special in 2008. Uh, Jennings had told his story to the Loose Change producers. It was supposed to go in Loose Change Final Cut. But Jennings said, uh, please don't put it in. It'll cost me my job. They left it out. But then a few months later, Jennings gave an interview to the BBC. But the BBC then distorted his testimony and made it appear like what he was talking about uh, was much later. And so the all-knowing narrator could say what they thought was an explosion was just debris from a fall, falling skyscraper. The BBC even made it seem like Jennings was all by himself, even though he kept saying, we went down the stairs and then we ran back up. They kept saying, Jennings, Jennings, as if he was all alone. This BBC show aired in July 2008. NIST, whose timeline the BBC had followed, released the first draft of its report the next month in August. Shortly before this release, evidently only two days from what people have been able to figure out, Barry Jennings, who was 53 years old, died mysteriously. It has been impossible to get any information about it other than the statement that he died in a hospital. Whatever the cause of his death, it was certainly convenient. He was not around to be interviewed again, perhaps by loose change. And the BBC was able to put out a new version of its special on Building 7. And this time, Michael Hess participated and confirmed the truth of the BBC timeline, saying, oh yeah, this was just debris from the North Tower collapse. Michael Hess had, in the meantime, become a partner in Giuliani's business. To see the falsity of the official timeline, however, one only needs to look at the interview that Jennings gave to Loose Change, which you can now watch for yourself by going on the internet and looking for Barry Jennings Uncut. In any case, the death of Barry Jennings may well indicate just how threatening the truth about Building 7 is to the official conspiracy theory. I will point out one more way in which Building 7 has proved to be the Achilles heel. I mentioned earlier that it came down in virtual free fall. In the first draft of its report, NIST claimed that the collapse took far longer than a free fall collapse would have taken. It, it had a theory of progressive collapse and explained you'd still have stuff down there that would resist, so you couldn't have zero resistance. But David Chandler, a high school physics teacher, put a demonstration on the web and showed that you could see easily that the building was coming down for over two seconds, not just in virtual free fall, in absolute free fall. Then he made a presentation to NIST at a public event that was broadcast. Somehow, evidently, they felt they had to admit free fall. So in the final report that came out in November, they admitted the building came down in absolute free fall for 2.25 seconds. But they didn't change their theory. Their theory was still one that did not allow free fall. So they have an absolute contradiction between their theory and an admitted empirical fact. This contradiction can well be seen as the ultimate self-destruction of, of the official conspiracy theory about 9-11 which says that Muslim terrorists brought down three buildings of the World Trade Center by flying planes into two of them. <laughs> I will conclude by addressing... <laughs> I will conclude by addressing members of the 9-11 Truth Movement, both old members and any new members who may have been created tonight. I, I am an optimist. Rather than letting up on our efforts to get the truth out about 9-11, now is the time to work even harder. For one thing, the cultural climate seems to have changed dramatically. When my first two books appeared, Publishers Weekly, which is the Bible for bookstores and libraries about what books are worth buying, they panned these books, ridiculed them as conspiracy theory, in 2008, November, 
The new Pearl Harbor Revisited was Pick of the Week by Publishers Weekly. Now I say that not to brag, but that too. But I say it to stress the difference. Though uh, back in 2004, 2005, it was not okay. A respectable organization couldn't name a book that says 9-11 is an inside job as a good book. But in 2008, that was possible. So it looks like a sea change has occurred in our culture. This can be a bellwether. Secondly, we have a new president in town and he has pledged to base his administration's policies on good science and good intelligence. I suggest that part of the 9-11 Truth movements now be aimed at the president to convince him that a new investigation is needed. He is a lawyer, a politician, and a religious man. So he may well be moved by learning that these types of people have formed 9-11 organizations urging him to authorize a new investigation. So besides carrying forward all our other activities, we should do everything we can to bring more scientists into the movement, to build up the size of lawyers for 9-11 Truth, religious leaders for 9-11 Truth, intelligence officers for 9-11 Truth, and especially political leaders for 9-11 Truth, because this is now what is most needed. Political pressure from political leaders around the world to authorize a new, truly independent investigation through which the truth about 9-11 can be revealed. And so that, and this is the important thing, so that policies based on the Bush-Cheney interpretation of 9-11 can all be reversed. Thank you very much. For Watching him on, on YouTube all week, and uh, this is much better than YouTube, obviously. What a treat. Um, how many of those uh, who, who have come here for the first time, this is their first truth event, now have a slightly different perspective on, on what happened on 9 11? Quite a few. Okay, uh, how many basically have the same perspective as when they, when they came in here? Also a few. Okay. Uh, I want to make a few announcements. Uh, first of all, thank you to Boston University on behalf of us, the sponsor, for, for hosting this event, the Free Forum. Thank you so much to Mary Elizabeth Moore. <laughs> Dr. Griffin mentioned uh, a movie that's really available. A lot of this if you see it, it's, it's, it's an extra, seeing is believing. So if you see a documentary, it adds an extra dimension to, uh, to the discussion, to the text of the facts. And he mentioned a movie called Loose Change. There are three of these. They are all available on YouTube. You can watch them for free. For those that are still skeptical, that's probably, the first one is what did it for me, actually. I like the first one. People like different of those, of those that really have studied 9-11 Truth, the third one. But uh, one of the filmmakers, Jason Bemis, and a lot of other truthers are actually going to be, and a lot from, uh, from Boston 9-11 Truth, are actually gonna be converging. There are gonna be a few speakers on different topics, but truth is gonna definitely be there on Lexington Green, which is uh, one week from Monday, Patriots Day. So the, the, the filmmaker that made Loose Change is going to be there on historic Lexington Green uh, right after the battle reenactments. And sort of the, the thinking is that this is, it is very patriotic to get to, get to the truth and to be, you know, at least 
to debate what the truth is on this issue because it does affect our liberties quite a bit. There are people from all over the political spectrum involved with Boston 9-11 Truth. What I'm going to ask you to do is tonight, we have a whole lot of bills to pay. If, if you are impacted by what David said and you want to help us out a little bit, if everybody could pull a $20 bill out of the wallet, I know this is a lot. These days, it's a Herculean effort to do that. But if you could do that, they're coming around with white buckets. You can also throw a question in there. You can also uh, sign up. Yes, right there. Oh, first one, yeah. And take me out. You know, I can't change my mind now. So. And for those of us that would like, if you'd like to do a little more and actually get involved, we should, could certainly use your help. And there's a sign-up sheet in front, one of those front tables for those that want to get involved. But right now, we're going to pass the buckets around and be as generous as you could. You can throw a question in there. And uh, speaking of the questions, uh, one more announcement. I believe I heard from Lenny that there's going to be a meeting among the veterans of uh, uh, the veterans group, Alphonse's group, and uh, I guess Alphonse will have the information for that if you want to attend the veterans group tomorrow. Lenny, is that tomorrow? I think it's, no, well, you, you have the information? Okay. Lenny has the information. The group's founder does not have the information. Where's Lenny? <laughs> okay. Anyway. Yes, to write it down. That we, we decided on that forum to begin with. Otherwise, things get very chaotic. We can't get them all done. So, all right. Uh, Tom, yep. questions go right in the buckets along with your donations. We'll quickly sort them out and get questions to Dr. Griffin right, right now. So. Okay. Uh, without further ado, Okay, uh, Sunday the 19th is, is, is that event, and then uh, Paul Revere's Ride, I believe, is that night or Saturday night. They have a reenactment. It's kind of cool. It's a cool family event. I've done it before. So now I'm going to call Dr. Griffin back to the podium to answer questions. Because we've been acculturated to believe conspiracy theorists are wacko. So just pointing out that the official theory is a conspiracy theory, people say, oh, oh, gee, never thought of that. And then when they realize that, then everything's on all fours. So then you can start talking about which theory fits the evidence. We got two conspiracy theories. So that was my suggestion. I'll leave it there. Okay, thank you. Next, try to go through these. Next question, do you think the dust sample evidence, you might want to retouch on what that is, will break into the mainstream media? It's already starting to do so in, in Europe. My, sist my assistant just sent me some uh, reports there that uh, both in the uh, Netherlands and in uh, and in Copenhagen, and in, in, in Denmark, um, it's getting some coverage. Now, whether it does in the United States, of course, is another matter. And that's one reason I'm going to Europe. I'm just now beginning a, a tour. I'll, I'll speak in 10 cities in Europe, because I believe that uh, we might have a better luck, uh, chance of getting a real investigation, uh, getting maybe a citizen's jury over there to look at the evidence and uh, pronounce. Um, and on that, on that point, uh, one thing I, I forgot to mention was that uh, just what, three days ago on Dutch TV, they did have a jury um, look at the question, was Osama bin Laden responsible for 9-11? And evidently the whole uh, five-member jury panel, plus the audience, all agreed there was not sufficient evidence to say that bin Laden was responsible for 9-11. So uh, it may be that the Europeans will uh, take the lead here. This one, comes, this one comes up a lot, Dr. Griffin. If 9-11 is a cover-up job, 
How could so many people be involved and it still be kept a secret? How many people were involved in the uh, production of the atomic bomb, the Manhattan Project? About 100,000. Harry Truman was the vice president. He did not learn about the atomic bomb until after he became president. Secrets can be kept. There was a war we started in Indonesia in 1957. 30,000 Indonesians were killed. We were flying planes. This secret was kept until a book came out in 1995. How many other secrets have been kept? By definition, we don't know. So you cannot say secrets cannot be kept. <laughs> you don't know how many secrets have been kept. Uh, furthermore, if you were involved in 9-11, you would be guilty of treason and mass murder. How many of you are going to say, oh, by the way, I'm guilty of murder and... Furthermore, <laughs> with the Atomic Project, they had what's called compartmentalization. Everybody except the people at the very top, they know a little bit. They just know what they're supposed to do. They don't know what the whole picture is. Furthermore, the people at the top, the people who do know, these are people who have been trained and who have proven themselves over the years capable of keeping their mouths shut. So this, is, this question comes up all the time, almost as much as where is Barbara Olson anyways? Uh, and so uh, don't take this question uh, so seriously. It is simply not the case that someone would have talked. Furthermore, nobody is asking these people to talk. In fact, anybody who comes forward is ridiculed as a conspiracy theory. They lose their job. And what's the benefit of talking? Now, if we had an investigation um, in which people were given immunity to testify and they were called to testify, uh, then you had a completely different situation. We don't have that situation. That's okay. it. David, I don't, I don't know if you've ever played speed chess before. We, we have uh, right here another novel, actually another book right here, just of questions in my hand. So the faster we can nail these off, what is the story about the gentleman in the government of Japan discussing the questions of 9-11? Yukihisa Fujita spoke out in a large committee meeting and um, went on for about 30 to 40 minutes, complete with graphs and everything about the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. This was when uh, the question of uh, whether Japan was going to renew its cooperation on the war on terror. And he was arguing that they should not because 9-11 appeared to be an inside job. Now, he had been educated on this by a truth activist, or a couple of truth activists in Japan, uh, particularly a young uh, woman named uh, Yumi Kikuchi, uh, who happened to also translate uh, the New Pearl Harbor into Japanese. And uh, so he, uh, Fujita, is one of the leaders of political leaders for 9-11 Truth, the other being Karen Johnson, the former state senator from uh, Arizona. So these are the two people who have founded political leaders for 9-11 Truth. So you got two very credible people. And another senator from Japan has also joined political leaders uh, for 9-11 uh, Truth. Thank you. Okay, we all know the movie Flight 93. How do you explain the passengers in the airplane in the field in Pennsylvania who purposefully brought the plane down, committing suicide for themselves and all the other passengers, presumably to save another hit on the Capitol, both from a psychological and a factual point of view? Why would these passengers purposefully crash the plane? Well, you don't have to explain something that didn't happen. And by the way, this is one of the many places where the official story changed. Originally, that was the official story. The heroic passengers got control and brought the plane down. But then they changed the story, and it was that uh, the heroic passengers were going to try to storm the cockpit, and then the evil terrorists uh, brought the plane 
uh, down. But uh, um, there is uh, abundance of reasons <laughs> to say this story didn't uh, happen, but the moderator has asked me to moderate my comments, so I'll just encourage you to read uh, uh, my discussion of Flight 93 in uh, New Pearl Harbor Revisited, and you'll see all the reasons to uh, believe the story didn't happen that way or either way. If this story is true, how can the towers be rigged? How can the explosives be placed? Uh, various ways, but uh, it's not up to us who don't have subpoena power, don't have access to secret records and so on, to come up with the details of what happened. Our job is to show the official story is false beyond a reasonable doubt. I would say... We have done that in spades. And you find out the truth by authorizing an investigation where you put, you subpoena people, you threaten them with prison if they don't talk, you give them immunity if they will finger the higher ups. And we could figure this out, this one, uh, within a week. I had heard also that there was a power down in the towers immediately before the attacks, and, and yeah. George Bush's brother, Marvin, was in charge of tower security. Yeah. Well, Tom, I can go on for 10 minutes about that if you want to. But that's true. I mean, if you want to know how somebody could have gotten in there, those things are relevant, that the president's uh, brother and also a cousin were uh, involved with security for the World Trade Center. And there were stories about times when the power was down and engineers were coming in and out and so on. Dust, dust. Uh, this one you can speak from direct experience. You spoke on Japan, uh, maybe on the European Parliament. Can you comment on how the story is unfolding outside the United States? Well, all I can report is that uh, the interest in Europe is, is increasing. And in spite, you know, you might think, well, now Bush and Cheney are out of office, uh, they're going to lose interest. Not at all. The uh, Annie McCone, who a uh, former MI5 member, and she's the one, in fact, who is uh, starting uh, intelligence office for officers for 9-11 Truth. Um, when she called around to see, did they want me to come over for uh, a lecture tour, even though I had just had Richard Gage, uh, there was enormous enthusiasm. So even though they were tired, they wanted to do another one. So uh, um, uh, there are various places, and in Japan, uh, enormous interest growing there too. So uh, uh, this, this is a worldwide movement. That's what we've got to realize. Another question people ask, you know, JFK, there was so much evidence and people working on this and provided, you know, very strong proof the official story was false. Nothing came of it. Well, how many people were working on that? A handful of people. You didn't have uh, movements for JFK assassination truth in every state of the Union and, and, and dozens of countries in the world because the war on terror has impacted everyone. And it's going on in spite of the fact the name isn't still being used. So people have uh, a motive to uh, get this truth revealed, to get those policies reversed. What political benefit, if any, does Obama or any politician get from reopening an investigation, and what will it take for us to build such a movement so that they will do that? The satisfaction of doing the right thing, for one thing. <laughs> the reputation of going down as one of the most courageous presidents in history. I mean, what more do we do? <laughs> and also, uh, just the knowledge that uh, he performed his duty to uphold the Constitution of the United States. There is no more serious crime, we say, than treason. This was treason. The definition of treason is attacking your own country or joining in an attack on your own country. This was treason. And so uh, it seems like a no-brainer. This has to be 
uh, prosecuted and uh, exposed and prosecuted. Yeah. We, we saw today probably of uh, the new people, maybe half of the people still, still are not convinced it was an inside job. This question asks, can you characterize uh, the audiences in the different countries you visited, how you've been received by the audiences? Well, I've been received very well, but these are self-selected audiences, uh, so <laughs> it's not surprising. Um, the, uh, what was interesting uh, was a press conference at the uh, Japanese uh, parliament, and there you had uh, mainly people who were not, uh, at least half of the people were not already supporters of the 9-11 Truth movement, and nevertheless, after they heard the evidence, um, they were very uh, receptive. And so it supports my, the, the, in a sense, the formal thesis of my lecture tonight, that if people get exposed to a significant portion of the evidence that the 9-11 Truth movement has amassed over those past seven years, they will no longer believe the official story. So that is the only, uh, you know, nut to crack is to get people to open their minds and uh, look at the evidence. My favorite of my own uh, DVDs is called 9-11 Let's get empirical. If people will get empirical about 9-11, rather than raising a priori objections, um, then the, it'll be all over very quickly. Dr. Griffin, please comment on what moved you as a theologian and a philosopher to become so involved in the issues relating to 9-11. The task of a theologian is extremely audacious. Our job is to try to imagine what the world looks like from the perspective of the creator of the universe, who I'm speaking now as a Christian theologian, who loves all peoples and in fact all creatures, doesn't favor one faction over the other, one nation over the other, isn't on one side of a com competitive conflict, loves all people, and also has spent many, many billions of years creating this universe and getting it to the point where there are creatures such as us. And now we are to the point where we are threatening to bring down this magnificent creation that we call the Earth, perhaps within the present century due to global warming and other forms of pollution or flat-out nuclear warfare. So our job is to try to speak from that perspective. What would, what is the divine will, simply put? What would uh, such a being? And if you're a theist, you believe that that is indeed the fact and that our highest loyalty is to that all-inclusive, all-loving uh, perspective. And so, if a false flag operation that is carried out in the name of imperialism to impose the will of one group on another group, to steal the natural resources of other peoples, um, there can be, in my view, no more important theological task than to work to try to expose uh, that lie that is my life. Address the media blackout. How extensive and successful has it been in ignoring the truth? Oh, about 99.9%. <laughs> A few things did slip through. And that's how I got started with Paul Thompson's timeline, which was based on mainstream stories, somehow made it in, and then, but contradicted the official story. Most of them weren't repeated, but they did appear once or twice before someone could squelch them. Likewise, on 9-11 itself, many reporters reported massive explosions going off in the building. 
Uh, some of the uh, news commentators talked about, you know, Dan Rather, Peter Jennings, and others talked about these buildings were brought down, you know, controlled demolition. They say that it looks just like controlled demolition, where you remove the supports from the bottom. Um, the next day, nobody was saying this. The newspapers were still reporting it, but then by September 13th, the newspapers were no longer reporting it. But you got a massive amount of evidence. And so if you look at my book, 9-11 Contradictions, you'll see that a lot of the contradictions are between what was being reported for the first couple days and then what was reported afterwards, after they got clear on what the official story was going to be. This is a good one. So why did they bother to even bring down Building 7 later in the day when it hadn't been hit by a plane? That wasn't too smart. Why'd they do that? <laughs> well, there are lots of different theories about it, and I don't know which one is right. One theory is there was stuff in there they wanted to destroy. Uh, another theory is that uh, Building 7 was the place that uh, uh, they were using to draw the airplanes into the Twin Towers. I mean, there are no pilots, uh, you know. These aren't, there are no suicide pilots, so you, it had to be, the planes had to be drawn in by some kind of uh, remote control. Uh, that's a theory. Uh, a theory is that uh, uh, Silverstein, who had taken out, he, who owned Building 7, took out a lease on, on the rest of them, uh, wanted to make several billion dollars. Uh, so <laughs> that would provide some motivation. And see, so you would have to get cooperation. It couldn't be all simply one motivation. Uh, the, the national leaders are going to have their own motivations. The people in New York City are going to have their own. Everybody's got to get something uh, from it. And, you know, it's very curious that you got all those buildings pretty close together, and then other buildings right across the street. And the only buildings that are destroyed are all seven World Trade Center buildings. So it might lead you to suspect someone just wanted to destroy the whole World Trade Center and uh, start over. What does it matter at what altitude cell phone calls may or may not have been made from Flight 93? Well, I used it in my account tonight, a few years ago. We used it to say, we don't think those cell phone, cell phone calls could have occurred. But now the FBI has said they didn't occur. <laughs> so we don't need that argument anymore. I used it just to explain why probably the FBI changed the story. And I've got several other examples of that. So in my book, uh, I put some new stuff in there. If you've read some of the older books, there, there is some new stuff in this. And one is about Amy Sweeney. Uh, a story I hadn't reported on before, and it's an astounding story of how the FBI changed its uh, report on her call to change it from uh, a cell phone call to uh, an air phone call. Another plane question, has there been any investigation on the passengers of the plane, I assume they mean the same plane, 93? Did they really die on that day? What happened to them? It's just very hard uh, to know, and I did do a a lot of research on this along with my assistant and we were going to write a paper on it and uh, at the end we just said it's just too speculative we we really don't have enough evidence so there are so many things where we just have to say we don't know and uh, but we don't need to know these things to know the official story is uh, false that's all we need to know and uh, we could find out these other things Okay, this is a more of a, of a theological question and a very difficult one, but uh, people have given up relying upon God and rely on government for their safety and well-being, thus so they emotionally can't afford to face the government as attacking its own people. I'd like to have your comment on this. Oh, I think that's a very good comment. Um, I have a... Uh, recent, I guess my most recent DVD is called 9-11 and Nationalist Faith. And uh, I argue in there that although most people would say the, the basic faith of America is uh, Christianity, Christian faith, that no, that's not the case. And I, I got this from uh, my former professor and Mary Elizabeth's former professor, uh, John Cobb, in many people's mind, the leading Protestant theologian in the country. And he argues that, uh, no, the basic faith of America 
of Americans is America. And uh, America the good, America the exceptional nation, which simply its leaders wouldn't do such a uh, thing. And, uh, and so even uh, many people who consider themselves Christian, when you get right down to it, they've got a stronger faith in their nation and a stronger loyalty. Uh, since we're in, in Boston, let me appeal to uh, Josiah Royce who said uh, religion is really around loyalty, that the ultimate religious to what or to whom are you most loyal? What is your ultimate uh, loyalty? Um, and I think that's right. And uh, so yes, indeed, if people have lost uh, faith in uh, whatever you want to call it, God, divine, uh, the universe as sacred reality, and so all you have is your nation. Uh, that's your object of religious devotion. Nationalism as, you know, then you can't stand this, it's particularly given the myth of America as, as the, the, the exceptional nation. And so, yeah, I think uh, in this respect, uh, religious faith is important. It, it can help people, it doesn't always. But it can help people face the ugly truth about their own nation because that's not the object of their ultimate uh, loyalty. End of, end of sermon. Very interesting. Probably you're one of, one of the few that, that could have answered that question so well. I can. I can believe that the World Trade Center and Pentagon destruction were planned and carried out by the Bush administration. But how do you explain the participation of 19 Saudis who simultaneously hijacked three planes in the suicide attack? And uh, Chris asked, could you also talk a little bit about air defenses on that day? I can just repeat my answer from before. I don't have to explain things that didn't happen. Uh, I have a paper that you can find, just go on, uh, Google it. Uh, called, Was America Attacked by Muslims on 9-11? And I go through the uh, 14 basic kinds of evidence that were to convince us that there were Al-Qaeda hijackers on the plane. And I show that uh, every one of them, when examined, falls apart. And that some of them are just too I mean, they're just absolutely absurd. For example, the idea that uh, one of the pilot's uh, passports was found after the North Tower had <laughs> collapsed. Can you imagine that explosion? And here comes the passport. You know? and, and so they realized that was too ridiculous, so they changed the story and said, oh no, they found it before the North Tower collapsed. So all the passport had to do, they fly into the plant building, you know, and there's a huge fireball. So the passport just had to fly out of his pocket, fly out of the plane, get out of the building without being burned up and fall to the ground. So all of the evidence is, not all of it is quite that funny, but all of it you can easily see is false. So this was just a summary of uh, the new Pearl Harbor revisited. So. Uh, if you need one more bit of motivation to buy that book, uh, there, there you got it. Okay, um, when, I, when I'm throwing a lot of these there, there a lot of those are repeat questions, they're either repeat questions or they're illegible. I'm not just like censoring them, just to let people know. What do you think the overall effect will be when we reach the critical mass, the tripping point? And, uh, will people who are implicated strike back again? Might there be another false flag hanging over our heads? I'll just have to appeal here and say, like Yogi Berra, I don't make predictions, especially about the future. So I, I just, <laughs> I don't know. I think all we can do is do what we can do and just uh, um, do everything we can to get the truth out and then uh, let's see what happens. So the, the world is um, indeterminable and, and unpredictable in, 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 in very complex situations like this. This one sort of asks uh, why we can't, there's a lot of different 
I actually think it's a good thing that there are so many different independent, as you mentioned, groups investigating 9-11 truth. This uh, person wants to know why we can't all unite into one big group. Oh, we probably could, but I don't see any value to it. Uh, I think it's better to have uh, a whole set of groups, but they are united in, in the sense. They're united in spirit, and you'll look at the wording of some of the petitions. They're very, very similar. So uh, uh, most of these groups are coming at it from the same point of view. But I want to go back to the previous uh, question, because I see we are down to two minutes, and there's one thing I want to say about what you can do as uh, someone here in Boston or nearby. Uh, there is uh, what ha has been known as the uh, New York City 9-11 ballot. The name has been changed. The leadership has been changed. It is now called New York City Coalition for Accountability. And the initials, if you want to write this down, because what you can do, one way, one thing would be to go to New York City and help them register people. They want to get up to 75,000 names by this fall. But another thing you can do is simply send money because, you know, for people to take off and go out and do this, they need to be paid. So if you can donate, uh, 10, 15, 25, 50, 100 dollars and send to this. So go on the website, uh, just go on Google and, and just uh, NYCCAN. In other words, New York City can, all one word, and then it'll tell you how to donate. Thank you. Okay, we, we have one, one more for you. Par pardon? Well, it's a ballot to, to, uh, to get it on the ballot to, to demand, it be, to let New Yorkers vote whether to have an investigation. And this would, this would uh, not only, this would, as I understand it, would, would, would uh, uh, require New York City to have an independent investigation of 9-11. So this could be uh, uh, the way you know, the truth might start to get publicly exposed. Okay, before I ask this final question, I just want to say thank you so much for coming out tonight. Thank you very much. You're going to be signing books, signing books in back. So maybe if you didn't get your question answered, you could go buy a book. I intend to buy a couple of them ask a few questions. If you want to join Boston 9-11 Truth and you didn't get a chance to, Chris wants you to fill out another one of these, but you can also, there's a sign-up sheet in front. I don't know if, uh, if, if Lenny or somebody could just man that sign-up sheet in front. That'd be the easiest way on the way out. Just give us your email address. We'll let you know what we have planned. Well, anyway, so what was so bad about 9-11? Please use the uh, collector. Okay, I'll answer this. Okay, I'll do this if you promise to let me get up the aisle before you fill in her, because uh, I need to get out there to the tables. Um, why was the communication so bad? This is another question I don't have to answer because it didn't happen. The communication was excellent, and, and this is revealed uh, by uh, the famous memo by, uh, uh, how can I blank on, on her name, Brown, uh, the FAA, uh, Laura, Laura, Laura Brown. And so she revealed that, that they were talking all the time with the military about Flight 77. The military said, we didn't get notified by the FAA until 924. She sent a memo to the commission and said, that's absolutely wrong. We were talking to them about Flight 77 long before that. So what the 9-11 commission do? They said, FAA didn't even notify them at 924. They never notified them until after the Pentagon was hit. So this is just one of the uh, 
like two or three hundred lies told in the 9-11 Commission report. Outlandish lies that are easily disprovable. But again, the mainstream, mainstream press will not tell you that. Well, thank you all very much, Boston. Thank you. Thank you.